Welcome to the Cooping the Call Analyst Chat. I'm your host. My name is Matthias Reinwart. I'm the director of the practice identity and access management here at Cooping the Call Analysts. My guest today is Warwick Ashford. He is a senior analyst working from London together with Cooping the Call Analysts. Hi, Warwick. Good afternoon, Matthias. We want to talk about a topic. And the name of the topic is Dora. And this sounds like a nice elderly lady or maybe a parrot, but both are false. So to start with, when we talk about Dora, what is it and why should we talk about it? Well, it's just one of the newest uh, pieces of legislation coming out of the European Union. It's part of a raft of legislation that they're, they're trying to gear Europe to be better suited to the kind of new digital world that we live in. And so there, there are lots of there's lots of other pieces of legislation like the Digital Act and the uh, EU Chip Act, and there's just kind of a whole long string of them that are kind of in the pipeline. But uh, this one came into force in January this year. 2023. And uh, although it's only coming into force in 2025, it's something that's going to take people a while to, to get ready for. And um, it's something that can, although it applies specifically to the financial uh, sector, uh, can be applied to any organization. It's just a good framework. Okay. When we talk about the, the impact that Dora will have, you've mentioned financial industry. Uh, how big will be the impact? And If we compare it to GDPR, which was also a regulation from the EU, um, does it have the same level of impact? Uh, I'm not sure that it will, because again, it's focused uh, specifically on the financial sector. So it doesn't apply to all organizations. It's just those in the financial sector and their ICT providers. Um, you know, so I don't think it's going to be a, a, a game changer like like GDPR was. I don't think we're going to talk about it quite as much. But I mean, it brings everything into one place because some of the things that are covered by this new act uh, were covered by the uh, NIS um, directive, and obviously its its successor NIS two. But um, the, the the other difference is that it's it's a regulation and and it's not a directive, and you know the the great thing about regulations is they apply automatically and uniformly to all European countries as soon as they come into force, without them needing to be transposed into national law, which was. Uh, you know, the, the problem with NIS and, and now NIS 2 is that it, it's going to be patchy. And that's what the European legislators were not unhappy about, is that they didn't see protection for the financial services as being uh, uniform across across the region. And so that's why I think they've made this now a regulation so that it's it's the same for everyone. And, and that's kind of part of the reason behind it is, is to kind of do away with uncertainty about, okay, which bit applies to me, which bit doesn't apply to me, how am I going to do this? It's it's just all kind of under one one thing, uh, which is is great. And um, yeah. And the other thing that's that's different about it, it introduces this idea of operational resilience testing, which we can talk a bit about later. But it, it's it's something new where it's kind of forcing people to actually test their ability to to do, to do things under operating conditions. Right. When we create, well, when somebody creates a new regulation, when there are new rules to be obeyed, there must be a reason for that. So, what are the objectives that want to, that need to be achieved that were not? covered with NIST with NIST 2 um, and which should be covered by international um, financial organizations? I don't think it's a question of things that weren't covered, but it was, they, yeah, well, they felt that there were kind of gaps in it and it was inconsistently applied. So it was the consistency, I think, they were wanting to uh, address most of all. So what I've learned is that it's mainly about reducing financial disruption and increasing consumer protection. So what do organizations actually need to do to achieve that? And what are maybe the challenges that they might um, encounter in implementing these regulations and following these regulations? Well, the overall goal of the regulation is to strengthen the resilience uh, and cybersecurity of EU financial entities, as we've said. And this includes banks, insurance companies, investment firms, uh, data reporting providers, and cloud service providers. And they want to streamline and improve previously existing rules. And they've added a few new requirements to improve the cybersecurity and to harmonize the cybersecurity regulations, as I was saying earlier. But the overall goal breaks down to three 
three main objectives. So you've mentioned the first two is reduce the administrative burden in terms of supervisory effectiveness and, and of the previous rules. And also they want to increase protection for consumers and investors. But I think the most important thing of, of uh, the DORA is to reduce the risk of financial disruption due to ICT failures and cyber attacks, because this was the concern is that every organization now in the modern world depends on ICT services and and technologies. And if they fail, then the organization fails. So there was this concern that if, if things in the financial sector fail, um, it's going to affect the entire EU region. And so that's why they've, they've, they've brought this uh, legislation in. But the, you know, the point that I think I also made earlier was that it, this doesn't apply just to financial organisations. It applies to all organisations. Uh, we're all that we've all got um, increasing attack surfaces. We're becoming all increasingly more reliant on on ICT, and so that's why I think it's a it's a great uh, framework for all organisations to pay attention to. But the the amount of work involved in achieving compliance, or, or just to kind of get in line with it, it could be considerable, in light with the fact that the regulation requires organisations to focus on. Uh, a digital resilience strategy, and this has got to be supported by a resilience framework that includes all the interconnected activities of the business. And they need to have a complete overview of the ICT ecosystem, uh, the supporting critical business functions, and an effective approach to business continuity, incident management, and third-party risk management. So this is to, to ensure that the, the necessary business support for all compliance related projects, it involves, it's, it's quite a big undertaking and it needs to involve the board and other business leaders as early as possible in the, in the planning process so that they're going to have time um, to, to do it by, by the enforcement date, which is in January 2025. Right. And you've mentioned that implicitly uh, several times. It's about Reducing, understanding, mitigating risk. So we're talking about ICT risk management. Uh, and this is something that I do as an advisor all the time. Um, when somebody asks me, where should I start implementing measures? I start to apply a risk-based approach, go top down, start with the most pressing risks and then go down. But this requires risk management, understanding risk, measuring risk. The risk. Um, are there any best practices that you could recommend that organizations should follow in applying ICT risk management? Well, I think the important thing is that they've got to they've got to have an ICT risk management process. I think you know many organizations they have risk management and uh, it's just general. Um, but in recent years, we've been talking more about cyber risk management. And here we're talking about implementing an ICT risk management process. So this is now focusing on on your, your technologies and your service providers. And um, so this involves minimizing ICT risk through identifying and mitigating all the risks that you identify. And then you've got to adhere to a comprehensive risk management framework. So if there isn't one, you, you need to get one. Um, and there are there is quite a bit of guidance in this legislation uh, to, to help with that. And then, of course, there's the whole uh, thing of uh, testing incident response and recovery capabilities. Because again, the focus here is very strongly on recovery because it's about being able to, to kind of withstand any sort of disruption and recover from any sort of disruption. And this can involve uh, regular security awareness training programs. And uh, then organizations should then consider things like the deployment of risk identification and mitigation solutions. So if you think of, of a couple of the uh, leadership compasses that I've been doing recently, like MDR and DP, uh, DLP, and then there are also other things like EPDR and XDR and um, ASM and SEAM and SOAR and uh, incident response, all these things feed into this overall risk management capability uh, focusing on, on ICT. Right. The, when I heard about DORA for the first time and I just re quickly skimmed through the, the, through the headlines, the first thing that really struck me was third-party ICT risk management or third-party risk management. And that is something that came across me here at Kupinga Coal uh, analysts some two years ago, and we called it cyber supply chain risk management, so CSCRM. Um, I think this has made its way into the regulation, making your suppliers do it at least as good as you should do it, right? 
Yeah, I think this is an important thing because, as you say, this is something we've been discussing about for a while and we've been advocating for a while. Uh, you're only you're only as secure as your supply chain, and uh, I think what we're seeing here is they're legislating for, the, for the, you know specifically to include third party risk as part of your overall comprehensive risk management framework. So you know that's just be, be aware that third party risk is an important risk to to take care of, and then that includes adopting a third party risk management strategy. And the important thing there, of course, is to review this regularly, make sure that it's up to date. And, and that it can do the job. Um, another thing that the, the legislation also kind of introduces is this idea of, of keeping a record of all contractual uh, agreements with ICT providers to make sure that you're not stuck. Uh, you know, if, if you assess your ICT provider as being not good enough in terms of your security requirements or whatever, you need to be able to exit that contract. So I think there's there's also a lot of emphasis now around, you know, you've got to be sure that you can evaluate your your providers regularly and if they don't come up to scratch, you can leave and, and that that's not going to disrupt the business because, as I said earlier, it's all about uh, making sure business co- is con- business continuity uh, and, and there is no, this is all part of this idea of resilience, that there's just no interruption to the business and um so yeah as i said you, you've got to you know ensure that the contacts can be terminated if necessary and that there are exit uh, strategies in place and then of course uh you know this is also something we've been around for a while but only the big players seem to be doing it is demanding risk assessments from all your third-party suppliers you know say okay you're a supplier of mine um I, re- I rely on 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 your service to pre- pre- uh, to deliver my service, and so I need to, I need to know what you're doing in terms of of risk assessment on on your side. And as you said earlier, you know, does it match what I need? Is does it match what I'm doing? Right. There are a lot of of great and interesting new concepts that made it through Dora into the organization. Another, and you've mentioned that already, and I I, I skipped across it, but but I want to come back to that because I think this is really of importance. It's operational resilience testing. So not only writing down a piece of paper with some mitigating measures and some controls and hope it works, but it really requires the actual testing and proving that the resilience mechanisms actually do work. How can this testing really look like without interrupting the business, but making sure that the, that the results, the, the, um, yeah, the overall process is really, um, showing that things will really work. How can you test something like that? Well, obviously, it's going to be something on an, on an ongoing basis, and I, I think uh, that's also what this legislation requires of the companies that fall in scope. I think the basic testing is required at least uh, once a year, so they've got to test all the critical ICT systems and applications. But once again, it, it's something that that uh, requires the setting up of an operational resilience testing programs for all the tools and systems that you use, and I. I guess this can be part of the procurement process. If you know, if 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 you're going to procure something, it's point it's pointless buying uh, or, or you know signing up to a new service until you've done the, the the testing. And then, as you say, you you know, like oh, it's more difficult to do it once it's up and running to not disturb the operations of the business. And um, what also this requires is to to do the the testing using independent third party. So you can't just say, okay, uh, you know, kind of let's just test this oh yeah it's fine it's got to be something that's through an independent third party it's got to be certified and it's got to be accepted by the the competent authorities so uh, that's that's uh, also something worth uh, noting you also asked what does it look like so i mean this is it includes gap analyses you know where or have we got everything uh, covered it also includes uh, physical security reviews uh, you have to look at things like physical access to to uh, ict systems you know or, or is everyone who has access to these things should they should they be getting access to it how tightly is the access controlled um, it's also about scanning software uh, source code reviews 
You know, is the source code, is everything in the source code okay? How much, how much dependency is there on open source code? How much control do we have? Um, it's also about compatibility testing. You know, will this work with the systems that I have? Will it cause any d- uh, disruption? Is there any potential? Uh, if there is, you know, you've got to put mitigating factors in, in uh, mitigating processes in, in, in place. And then performance testing. And then, of course, uh, good old penetration testing is, you know, how, how easy is this to, you know, how easy is this for the bad guys to get in um you know so that those are all the components of this testing and it, it's it's quite i think it's that's going to be the most significant change for, for a lot of organizations because i i think you know things like source code reviews uh, uh, typically that's not widely done and uh, so i think this is going to be something that that organizations are going to struggle with uh quite a bit and that's it's one of the the the, the hallmarks of this piece of legislation Right. I think there there is a lot of work to do for organizations who really want to follow DORA and when they, when they are using many um, online services or other ICT services provided by third parties. And of course, behind a third party is a third party. So that this, is a, it's a, this is a daisy chain um, of services that, that um, interact with each other. So this only works if the chain is complete. Um, there are lots of interesting concepts. I've mentioned that and I want to highlight one Final one, because this is something that many organizations typically are hesitant to implement, but DORA encourages financial institutions to share cyber threat information within a trusted community and to use this information um, to, to get better with their own cybersecurity posture and to support the community with this information. Um, so how can an organization actually do that, sharing this information while protecting yeah, sensitive information of their own customers, of their own business, intellectual property, or whatever. How can that work out? The legislation provides a little bit of guidance on this, but uh, just to talk generally uh, for a, a little bit, um, again, this is something, this is best practice that we at Cooping & Cole have been talking about for a couple of years, and certainly is one of the prime things that comes up at EIC every year. Uh, that's our big uh, event that we have, and we when we get together, the uh, specifically the identity uh, community, where you know it's it's all about sharing information, and so this is great again to see uh, legislation uh, encouraging, as you say, uh, communities to to share this. Now, once again, because of this is the financial community within this context. You know, it's about encouraging financial entities to share with other financial uh, entities, but it can be done on on a broader community. So once again, the emphasis on the, the need for starting to plan now. Twenty twenty five may sa- sound like a long time in in, in the distance, but uh, you know you need to start putting processes in place now for sharing cyber threat information with other financial entities, with other fi- uh, with other organisations. If you're not uh, in the scope of this thing, um, but of course now you have to ensure that the information sharing arrangements protect potentially sensitive commercial and per- personal information. And this is what the actual legislation warns about. It says, you know, you, you have to, you know, we encourage you to share. Sharing is good, but you have to make sure that that, that you've put um, arrangements in place to make sure that potentially sensitive information is protected. So it's about defining the conditions for Participation of 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 entities um, and the the involvement of third party service providers and sort of operational procedures. You have to kind of def- all these have to be defined. So again, you know, don't waste time because this all has to be done. But the great news is that the uh, European Board of Directors of the Banking Industries Cyber Risk Information Sharing Network (FSISAC). Uh, has been set up and it will provide members with a single point of contact for coordinating cyber related information uh, between financial entities but again you know wider wider application there are isac groups uh, in all the in 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 several different sectors so if you are interested in sharing information uh, with other organizations securely in a way that you know is going to be of mutual benefit, uh, then you know join one of your one of your industry or join your industry ISAC and and they will help uh, 
coordinate that. So um, I think that's a, a, a great thing that now there's a European board of directors, so there is no issue with uh, data going outside of Europe. Uh, it's all kind of contained within that, and uh, that, that the FS ISAC has facilitated this. Interesting to learn that. That's really a, a, a good point. So that has already work been started to share this information. Um, you have worked on Dora uh, from the from an analyst perspective, and you've created a document, an advisory note that covers Dora. And I think this is really an interesting um, um, work to read, and I highly recommend that. Once again, finance industry, uh, insurances, banks are on the forefront of the maintaining cybersecurity and governance. But you've mentioned that in, at the very beginning, what's in there should be relevant for almost any industry. Yes, absolutely. I, I think that it's it's a great framework, and and it sort of highlights you know it highlights five key areas that 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 uh, organisations need to look at. And um, yeah, so go go and have a look at my adv advisory note, and that'll help uh, pull out the main sections of the legislation. Because uh, I did go through the legislation. There is a lot of stuff there. There are hundreds of pages, literally. Uh, but I, I've tried to distill the things that are most important and that'll be of most interest to organisations. Right. And you've mentioned EIC as an event where people come together and talk about sharing information regarding identity and access management and the threats towards these systems up and out about interoperability. There, are, Of course, I cannot close down this episode um, without mentioning the Cyber Revolution, um, an event that will take in mid of November, which is more focusing on cybersecurity, which of course also will touch upon DORA um, when it comes to implementing cybersecurity compliance mechanisms and modern ways of how to deal with that. So also this is highly recommended. Um, any final thoughts from your side when, before we close down? Oh, no, I'm just looking forward to Cyber Revolution because, as you say, there are a couple of sections on on uh, Dora, there are a couple of presentations rather on on Dora. But uh, again, you know, here we are going to be working to be building a cybersecurity community uh, as we've built up uh, an identity community. And I, I encourage everybody to come on, uh, along and uh, take part and join up and learn what they can learn. Absolutely, and this is what these events are for. For also for just socializing, for getting to know people, finding peers, talking to them, learning from them, sharing information, as we just discussed. And um, if we have made the, uh, or if we have completed the task to uh, bring the abbreviation DORA to the minds of our audience, so that it's Digital Operational Resilience Act from the EU, then we have achieved something. Thank you very much, Warwick, for being my guest today, and for going through all these pages and distilling out um, a 15-page advisory note that is really helpful. Thank you. Thanks.